Uh, we'll move on to the, our second presentation uh, made by uh, Caroline Hildebrandt, um, who is a former student of the École Normale Supérieure de Lyon. She has previously taught at King's College London and currently teaches at the Ernest de Lyon, where she is a PhD student in her second year under the supervision of Professor Francois Speck. And her dissertation focuses on Herman Melville's late oeuvre and the links between literature and theology, seeking to delineate a philosophy of secularization in the writings of the author. And I'll let her tell us more about that. You have the floor, Caroline. Thank you very much. Herein tis never as by Nile, from waste to garden, but a style. Betwixt rejection and belief, shadings there are, degrees and brief. These lines are uttered by Derwent, one of the characters composing the party of pilgrims journeying through the Holy Land in Clarel. In this canto, Derwent is sitting with Clarel, the main character of the eponymous poem, and tries to convince him to forsake too radical a faith. I'd like to focus on the first two lines. These are based on Melville's, Melville's visit of Cairo in 1857, a rendition of which you can see in the second quote, which is an excerpt from his journal as he visited the Middle East um, in 1857. Melville makes a spiritual experience of general disillusionment as he visits the Middle East and the Holy Land. In Egypt, from where he is writing in the journal excerpt proposed here, Melville still senses a sharp limit, a strong border separating good and evil, verdure and desert, abundance and scarcity. Yet, as he writes Clarel, that is to say some 20 years later, Melville has arrived at a recognition of a general regime of difference rather than binary oppositions in the modern world. In his study Sacred Uncertainty, Brian Yodders sees in Melville's writings a general regime of religious difference. Taking up Derrida's notion of difference, he senses that differences are both generative of meaning and never absolute, leading to an endless deferral of definite meaning. When Melville looked at religion indeed, it was with an eye to finding both contrasts and analogies. And this way of looking at belief seems to be best described by a term like difference, with its notes both of the contradictory and the complementary, but also a sort of principled deferral of faith. In other words, betwixt rejection and belief, shadings there are degrees and brief. In Clarel, indeed, there is no move from waste to garden. Eden is never to be found again. On the contrary, faith and doubt are not resolved but deepened, <coughs> fragmented and intensified. The poem indeed offers a total cartography, a mapping out of the wasting of traditions which I will argue is however not a hopeless one. So I will guide you through this wasting of tradition through five main steps. I will first start with a brief summary of the poem, giving way to the presentation of my methodological pris prism, which resorts to the theology of Rudolf Bultmann. I will show how the letter helps me map out the wasting of traditions and the quest for Christ in the Holy Land, charted by the characters of the poem. I will then present the way the poem stages this religious difference as a search for and recognition of the loss of traditions in a Judeo-Christian world, but also the exploration of remnant traces of Muslim and Asian, Asian religions and spiritualities. This will enable me to finish this presentation with my definition of a political historicity and poetic messianism, which I argue are the underlying ontologies fostered by the poem. Clarel narrates the arrival of a young divinity student tormented by doubts at Jerusalem. In the midst of the holy places, he falls in love with the young Jewish girl Ruth, whose father is killed by hostile Arab raiders. In the period of mourning that follows, Clarel is forbidden by Jewish custom to see anything of the girl, and in his grief he sets out on a pilgrimage through the Holy Land and back at length to Jerusalem again. On his return to the city, Clarel finds that Ruth has died of grief in his absence, and his own future seems more uncertain than ever. The poem is divided in four parts. The first part consists in the Jerusalem canto, cantos, sorry, and brings together the majority of the characters who will interact throughout the poem together. The wilderness cantos then show the pilgrim in motion traveling out from Jerusalem into the desert. 
In Marsaba, that is the third part, the pilgrims come into contact with faith as represented by Eastern Orthodox Christian monks and perform several monologues exemplifying their struggle with faith. In the Bethlehem Cantos, the pilgrim eventually return to more characteristic sacred sites. The poem ends, it ends with Ruth, Death and Clarel alone in Jerusalem, mourning during the 40 days of Lent all through to Pentecost, during which he is seen airing on the Via Crucis in, in Jerusalem in a procession with other nationalities and sundry animals gathered under the phrase cross bearers all. So the characters in the poem are all pilgrims looking for creedal certainty, looking for an understanding of the traditions and historical situation. And in order to map these out, I'll first present the methodology I'm using. So, Rolf Bultmann was a German theologian from the beginning of the 20th century, whose hermeneutical theology I use in my literary analysis. Bultmann's theology offers a new understanding of Christ, both as a historical figure, but also as the vehicle for a personal understanding of faith by the believer, which he calls the charismatic or eschatological value of Christ. In Boltman's theology, the charisma designates a word with performative power, and this word cannot be dissociated from the figure of Christ, understood not as a person, but as an event which only exists as a personal meaning calling out to the believer. The historical Jesus is thus only the prop for the charismatic Christ. Yet, the historical conditions and materiality of the historical Jesus must be known to understand how his word managed to chart a new understanding of time and history. That is my second point. In a system, Bultmann aims for an existential understanding of history. He aims at reconceptualizing history not as an objective science of fact, but as a guide toward an enduring meaning, the enduring meaning of the historical past event and the present moment. This he calls Geschichte. And this Geschichte fosters a new historical condition he calls historicity. The historical condition of mankind, or historicity, is caught in a double injunction, that of the past and that of the future. And this new temporality calls out to man's responsibility, which is constantly at play in historicity. Eschatology, thus, is reconceptualized not as a teleology inherent to history, but as the understanding of the present time being pregnant with the past history and the possibilities of the future opened by the event of Christ, perjuring in its actualization and the capacity of the human subject to make decisions. As such, history as historicity receives a new dimension, dimension sorry, stemming from the knowledge of self. This personal understanding of self is to be explored in visions of the world, this is my third point, he calls Weltanschauungen, and which disseminates themselves, sorry, mostly, but not only, in the religions of the world. An authentic and durable Weltanschauung is to be found in its capacity for transmutation and re-emergence throughout history. To Bultmann, the authentic understanding of historicity is thus an existential one, and acting out of the Weltanschauungen, the human subject feels able to correspond to his or her historical situation. In Clarel, the characters act out their respective Weltanschauungen and they test the validity of these in their quest for the traces of the historical Jesus in the journey through the Holy Land. This journey results in a re-reading of their traditions. If Bultmann's prism remains an existential one, I shall argue that the journey through the Holy Land in Clarel opens up on a new kind of historicity I shall term a political historicity. The latter consists in the rereading of the fossilized conceptions of history and the charismatic Christ performed by the diverse characters of the poem. By charting out the liberation from form of Weltanschauungen, I argue that the poem opens on what I call a poetic messianism. So we will first look at the geographical quest displayed by the poem to delineate the geographical wasteland in which the search for Christ is enacted resulting in what first stands out as a corrupted historicity. The trajectory which structures the poem is indeed a developing symbol system which joins the city, the holy land, deserted landscape and the Dead Sea. Waste is the most prevalent imagery recurring and linking all these together. Clarel opens in the city to which the hero has come questing for the grail of clarity. 
The city itself carries its own message to Clarel. It has no play of life. It displays only blind arches, I quote, parapets all dumb. Visiting the poorer sections of the town, Clarel notices its wasteland quality alike, which is the second quotation you have on the board. As you can see, the word waste punctuating the poem actually already foreshadows the desert of the Holy Land they encounter in the second section. The assembled pilgrims in the second section leave Jerusalem for their 10 day excursion to Jericho, the Dead Sea, the monastery of Mar Saba, Bethlehem, and then back to Jerusalem. The party travel through the wilderness. They reach the blank indifference of the stony desert, forging another link between the mute Jerusalem and the stony landscape, a symbolical network which is furthered in the following canto, which is the second quotation. The desert here is again a deserted waste, however it is personified, but beyond humanity and even beyond the ordinary pers personifications of the Christian divinity. As they enter the immediate environs of the Dead Sea, they remark its hellish quality. I quote, "'Tis like Plutus Park. It's a place of slime and stunted vegetation. The Dead Sea is a mere liquid waste associated with its biblical lore. Dead branches stranded, no motion being but that of the sea, and so on and so forth. The shore is a place connected with stories of killing and destruction." In the third part, the party continues its pilgrimage, turning from the Dead Sea to Saba, Bethlehem, and back to Jerusalem, completing the circle. But again, the tone of the landscape is set down clearly. We again find the, the word waste, which punctuates the poem. And eventually, in part four, they round up the waste circumference. The pilgrims come up through the city of Jerusalem, oppressed by the events of the pilgrimage, looking forward to taking up life again. The landscape, however, conveys the sense of a concentrated evil still present in Jerusalem, as you can see in the current quotation shown on the board. So the static geographical elements in Clarel map out a highly emblematic landscape. The dynamic of the pilgrimage through this wasteland, however, also testifies to a corrupted historicity. This will be my, ne my next point. This pilgrimage through the landscapes of the Bible is concomitant with the search for the figure of Christ. What stands out, however, is the structural impossibility to apprehend Christ, not only his historic steps, but also Christ as a charismatic event. Throughout the poem is indeed made a synthetic illusion sorry, of the figure of Christ and the Christ story itself. Christ is first of all seen as a sort of pastoral figure, a genial Pan, whose avatar trickles down history in a in a reshape, constantly reshaping form of deity, as you can see in the first quotation. The Edenic, how, the Edenic image, however, is perverted and disenchantment prevails, eventually giving way to death, not followed by any kind of resurrection. The concluding canto finishes the story by reporting the Easter celebrations in the Holy City. However, resurrection is here a mere folk festival. The ritual commemoration of events are remote and legendary, and all the words referring to Christ and to nature are capitalized, linking the resurrection of Christ to mere nature rituals in the endlessly repeating cycle of the natural year. The general trajectory through the, waste, through the wasted landscapes of the Bible and the syncretic effacement of the liturgy testifies to what I call a corrupted historicity that the characters experience in the poem. The structure, however, is the scene of acting out of the latter's traditions, which are seen as failure, failures in this modern corrupted historicity. So this is my next part. Many religious traditions are at play in the poem, yet some are more often than not exposed as radical outlooks which lead the characters personifying these either to utter isolation or to death. It is the case of several of the monomaniacs, such as Mortman, who spends the trip bewailing the ever-present depravity of mankind, which prevents him from generally connecting with the other characters. As his name testifies, Mortman, dead hand, is seen chewing his hand in his sleep while in his sleep until he bleeds, being so tortured by the fall forever." Quotation. Likewise, Nehemiah, though geni a genial companion of the party, enacts his mil millenarist vision to the full by stepping into the Dead Sea and drowning in it. Convinced he is to see the new Jerusalem rising in the midst of the water. 
By millenarism, I mean a belief common in 19th century evangelical Protestantism, Protestantism, sorry, and the imminent second coming of Christ on earth, which will then lead to Christ's thousand year rule. So instead of these dollarist and isolated experiences, the trajectory of the point eventually veers toward heterodoxies. First of all, in the case of hedonists and Epicureans, uh, embodied by the Lyonese. The Lyonese is a French Jewish merchant, native of the reg region of Lyon in France, and he's yet showcased in the poem as an archetype of androgynous classic beauty, but he's also marked with the sheer sensuality and utter disregard of any theological question. His form of Bacchus, I quote, is completed with his rich tumbled chest and hood of curls like to a Polynesian girls, which take him on a metaphorical plane outside of Judeo-Christian time. He, however, shows a keen knowledge of theological question, but never really gives proper answers to them, to these, sorry. Islam in Clarel is also present, first of all, in a laudatory way. However, it also displays some branches and some corruptions of these are also displayed in the poem. This is the case of the characters of Bilex and the Arnold. Both are soldiers, having had to fight either for the Ottoman Sultan or employed as mercenaries in other regions. It is, however, their military obedience which guide their choices, not their creedal observances. And this intermingling of faith and politics Melville condemns in the poem by underlining their disregard of Muslim practices superseded by their martial habits having perverted these. For instance, the Arnon is seen quickly mumbling a benediction to Allah before indulging in a war song. Thank you. Derwent, our next character, uh, embodies uh, what I would like to call too facile a liberalism or too facile liberal theology. He is an Anglican churchman belonging to the latitudinarian tradition of the Church of England, England, synonymous with dogmatic freedom and theological liberalism, a belief in science and also a rejection of ecclesial authority. He considers God as a universal force which flows in the religions of the world throughout time and the continents. His has been targeted as being too facile, a kind of glee, uh, since he's constantly op quite optimist in the poem. He, however, nevertheless stands as the proponent, proponent of an ever perduring religious capacity. The poem also tackles the failure of national hermeneutics. This is the case with the character of Unger. He is a lapsed Catholic Cherokee from Maryland who fought in the Civil War for the Confederacy. It's a Catholic Cherokee fighting for the Confederacy and is now a Turkish and, Egy and Egyptian mercenary. His is an ambiguous ethical position. He rants against settler colonialism, democracy and capitalism, which deems all the byproducts of Judeo-Christian hermeneutics. However, he himself is embedded in these, as he terms himself, I quote, a wandering Ishmael from the West. His disillusioned exile is cast as another reenactment of a biblical myth. Eventually, the poem offers several traces of Asian spiritualities which structure the poem. This is first of all the case of Buddhism. Indeed, by the end of the poem, Clarel withdraws into anonymity, which some critics have compared to the bull principle of annihilation of the self to reach nirvana. Clarel's nirvana, however, is not an atheistical annihilation, but a Weltanschauung which is recuperated in the Christian paradigm and wedded with the personal experience of the passion, thus creating an existential and personal historicity. The Christ event is taken up and wedded with contemporary spiritual debates and is thus actualized and revivified, made personal and new, gaining a new abundance which is something Melville charted out in his later poetry as he still keeps on dealing with Buddhism, using the very same words he used uh, to describe Clarel's trajectory as he vanishes in the obscure town, but also uh, repeating these very words and wedding these uh, with excerpt from James 4.14. Mm -hmm. So the poem has outlined the inevitable corruption of the believer, calling for the desperate survival of a tradition. Yet religious traditions in Clarel are either dollarist or isolated experiences or perverted and liberal versions of these theologies. The perennity and viability of Judeo-Christian Weltanschauungen seems impossible. However, 
By resorting to Eastern religions and theological traces as underlying tem underlining temporalities, Melville supplements the Christian visions by looking at other religions, thus opening up Christocentrism. Thence emerges a new kind of historicity, one in which disseminated fragments of ethos of Weltanschauungen circulate between the diverse characters of the poem, responding to their complexities. This is what I call a political historicity. And this will be my final point. This political historicity charts a new poetic messianism. So between millenarism and divers' quest for creedal certainties, almost all the characters embody a quest for a type of spirituality, but also for the principle and the building of a community. That is to say, they reenact the covenantal narrative, which is the essence of American Puritanism, the founding myth of which is that of the Exodus. Hannah Arendt has suggested a reading of the Exodus as a founding political experience toward the emergence of a political community. This experience in her reading builds on the sharing of a common sufferance, the community being built in the biblical myth and the movement of escape away from the oppressor. According to Arendt, suffering must, however, give way to a founding liberty to be able to foster a political community. In Clarel, the trajectory of the pilgrimage, if akin to the Exodus for being a reenactment of the covenantal narrative and binding the characters together through common sufferance, this trajectory, have, have, however, results in no final eschatological recapitulation, no resurrection. What stands out is the absence of any ontology of time. However, I would argue, and this will be my last point, that it is by dramatizing the shared recognition of the ultimate contingency of history that the poem ushers a founding liberty, which I call poetic messianism. Oops, sorry. If from waste to garden there be but a style, this style is not a sharp line dividing the two which must be overcome. It is the in-betweenness of ever-present contingency which we must learn to navigate, exploring the Weltanschauungen and traditions demanding to be composed and recomposed ever again. Thank you for your attention.